Dr. Marvin Jones is our first speaker this morning. He's assistant professor of theology and church history at Louisiana College. He's the author of The Beginning of Baptist Ecclesiology, The Foundational Contributions of Thomas Helwes. Also the author of Recovering Historical Christology for Today's Church and Basil of Caesarea, His Life and Impact. He has multiple doctorates. His first is in church history. He's been a pastor of First Southern Baptist Church in Henderson, Nevada, outside of Las Vegas. He's been in ministry for 37 years uh, on church staff and pastoring for over 20 years and has been teaching full-time for 15 years. He is married to Stacy, his wife of 35 years, and has a grown son, an accountant, and a daughter-in-law, and a grown daughter, a school teacher. His presentation title today is An Examination of Edward Fudge's Assessment of the Church Fathers Concerning the Doctrine of Hell. And let me just say a personal word uh, before Dr. Jones comes and speaks. You can always tell the character of an individual by drinking coffee with them and visiting with them and so on in an informal setting. I can tell Dr. Jones is a very humble man, very intellectual, but very humble. Uh, he is from the Southern Baptist Convention, and many of you are affiliated with Southern Baptist. He does hold to a traditional view of hell, but he's the kind of person uh, who has the big heart to love people with different views. So today, what he's going to do is take an examination of Edward Fudge. And for those of you who do not know who Edward Fudge is, one of his books is out on the table. And I was telling uh, Dr. Jones earlier this morning at breakfast, my shift from the traditional view of hell uh, to conditional immortality uh, began reading Froome. Uh, and Fudge based most of his writings on Froome, the conditional faith of our fathers. Um, and so I'm interested in hearing from Dr. Jones his views on how Fudge might have missed it on the early church fathers. To me, this is an example, Chris, and I have to thank you for this, of having a conference where you're not just hammering one view on, onto people saying, you must believe this. This is a conference where we're rethinking hell and we're going to be hearing different views. And so let's welcome Dr. Jones as he gives us his talk this morning. Well, good morning. Oh, there's a few friendly people here. You want to do it again? Good morning. Good morning. There you go. I want to say thank you to Reverend Chris Date for the invitation to come here and to Emmanuel Baptist Church and certainly the pastor, uh, Wade Burleson, for hosting us. It's been wonderful. It's been great. I've been spoiled. And I'm tempted to stay, but I won't. So, but thank you for your hospitality. Two caveats this morning before we begin. Number one, uh, I, I do intend to critique uh, Fudge, and sometimes it's a little harsh, I will admit that, but please don't assign motive to him or me. Uh, I'm simply critiquing his writings. I do not believe uh, for one moment that he was trying to move Christianity to a liberal position or anything like that. I believe the man uh, actually adhered to what he wrote, and so I'm taking that at face value. So again, don't assign, please do not assign motives to, to him at all. Uh, number two, I started not to do the first section of this because I thought, eh, who cares about the church fathers? But last night told me that some people do, so I'm going to go ahead and include about five minutes of intro to them this morning before we actually get to Fudge. So this morning, I want to review the work of Edward Fudge as he investigates the church fathers. By way of definition, the church fathers are those pastors, apologists, and theologians who lived between the years 100 A.D. and roughly 650 A.D., I think the rise of Islam in the same time period contributed to the demise of the patristic period, although I have a lot of colleagues who disagree with me on that, and that's, that's fine. But the appeal to the church fathers is twofold. First, it is an appeal to the earliest sources we have for Christianity. The thought is that if one could understand the teachings of the earliest sources, that in itself becomes a guide for the contemporary church to emulate which is the reason, I'm shameless plug here, we did the book about that. For $15, you can have that, I'm sorry. 
There's some truth in this issue. As Baptists, we believe our faith is the same faith that the apostles were taught by Jesus Christ. This faith has been preserved for us to emulate. The Apostle Paul informed Timothy uh, and other Christians to mimic him as he mimicked Christ. And the only way to do that is to practice what that person does and says. So the appeal to the church fathers is a means of getting back to the closest sources we have in order to mimic uh, for the gospel and church purity. The second reason to appeal to the church fathers flows out of the scriptural command to teach faithful men who will be able to teach others. 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. The command is restated by Jude to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints for all. The oral communication of our faith is to be passed on to succeeding generations in the same way we received it, pure and undefiled by cultural, philosophical, and intellectual reasonings. So the appeal to the church fathers acknowledges that their teaching in the area of church practice and doctrinal beliefs is kind of a standard for us, especially the first 500 years. And I'm going to move away from my script for a moment. There's not one uh, creed or confession that we adhere to in the modern world that contradicts the confessions and creeds of Christianity within the first 500 years. They had that type of impact. So it's my humble opinion that it's a valid approach to understand the faith practice of the fathers. And this is exactly where men like Edward Fudge, Leroy Froome, uh, Earl Ellis, uh, and many build their contemporary theological foundations on the traditions of the fathers. Now, I state these men because, one, I respect them, and two, I disagree with them, uh, but nonetheless, they did appeal f to the church fathers, um, and adequately so. Those of us who study the patristic era are trying to demonstrate solidarity with the past. And if that can be accomplished, then one's claim stands to be reasonably heard, okay? That you can connect your faith with what has been handed down to us. Now, that being said, there are contemporary problems with patristic appeals. I've been reading these guys for 25 years. And I've also read other authors who also read the fathers. And there's one thing I've noticed about the appeal to church fathers. It's very selective. Let me give you a couple of examples. No one I have read is a champion of the church father origin. No one likes him. He believed in the preexistence of the souls. And that's where he gets slammed a lot. It's right there. Most patristic scholars do not advocate his teachings as they were condemned in 553 at the Second Council of Constantinople. Yet Origen's teachings influenced Basel and the Cappadocian fathers. Now why is that important, Jones? What are you getting at? Because many contemporary patristic scholars embrace the Cappadocians as part of the tradition of the faith, but they reject Origen as being outside orthodoxy. I think that's a bogus approach. I'm not claiming nor advocating that origins should be held in better regard. I'm simply stating my observation of how evangelicals use the patristics. We like this guy, we don't like this guy, but there may have been a connection between those two guys. But we don't do that. I'm going to give you another example of the problem of appealing to the church fathers. Prior to 325 AD, there were two active traditions alive in the church concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Both positions were opposite of one another. Both appealed to the church fathers for lineage and acceptability. And both even appealed to the scriptures. One was the Arian hermeneutic and one was the Athanasian hermeneutic. And there's much more to the story than I'm giving you. I just don't have time to, to really dive into it. But the Arian her hermeneutic claimed that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist. In other words, Jesus Christ was not the eternal Logos. And this hermeneutic appealed to scriptures like Proverbs 8.22, where God called forth his wisdom, made him, that sort of thing. And they took this to mean that the Son of God was not eternal. The Athanasian hermeneutic, on the other hand, adhered to the position that the Son was eternal with the Father, and they used the scripture John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they made their appeal that he is eternal. Now, do you catch that? Both appealed to the scriptures for the basis of, of their proclamation, and both appealed to the legacy of the church fathers. Arius told us where he learned this at, and so did Athanasius. They appealed to both as a foundational theological system, and at the end of the day, both were at a stalemate. This battle raged until it was finally settled by the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., 
The council concluded no longer would Arianism be considered a viable orthodox position that should be recognized by Christianity by 381. The um, coffin had a nail put in it. Arianism from 325 to 381 was alive, but by 381, with that council appealing to the previous council, sealed the deal. Arianism after that was no longer considered orthodox. The decision had consequences for contemporary Christianity that's hard, hard for us to miss. The modern day Jehovah's Witnesses embraced the very doctrines of Arianism, or at least a form of it, a strong form of it. No one that I know of, and I hope I'm proven wrong on this, accepts, um, actually has debated with Jehovah's Witnesses. That's what I'm hoping that I don't know anyone that's done that. But no one I know of accepts them as part of Christian orthodoxy because of what happened in the past. Now, the problem with acknowledging or denying Jehovah's Witnesses as a part of orthodoxy is that current theologians do not consider their earlier historical and theological positions of the church. Okay, we just don't go back that far. So it's quite possible to have two different traditions within the church then and now, both claiming patristic lineage, both using the scriptures for their support, both accepted in contemporary Christianity, but having no reference to an earlier counterpart. That makes reading the fathers difficult as it forces current arguments onto them that may or may not have been valid. This is typically called anachronism. I, I use this a lot with my students. I ask them the year the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor, and you know I actually get answers? <laughs> Wrong ones, but I get the answer. Um, how many of you believe Germany bombed Pearl Harbor? Of course you don't. They believe it. <laughs> okay. I tell them, yeah, it happened in 1943. I know it's early. You think about it. <laughs> okay. The church historian and the theologians could be accused of denouncing Jehovah's Witnesses because of the claim of acronism. Aren't you just reading something back into history that didn't belong there? Yet, making an appeal to the Nicene Creed, is it really valid for today's issues? I think the answer is yes, even though it binds contemporary Christianity to earlier decisions. But again, we're trying to adhere to the faith that was handed down to us from the apostles. And in order to do that, you do have to look at history. And there's a second problem with appealing to the church fathers and tradition is that the concept of tradition slowly, over time, moved into the same position as Scripture. In other words, by the medieval ages, tradition did not simply interpret Scripture but in itself became a revelation equal to Scripture. No one on this platform that I know accepts that premise, at least that I'm aware of, but the concept is acceptable in certain churches. So appealing to the church fathers is not a means of continuing revelation or learning new revelation of God, but serves as a means of assessing theological problems in ministry for coherency for the faith that was handed down to us. So this assessment should not be regarded as harsh or anachronistic. It's just simply saying, what did Fudge really understand about the church fathers? All right, so the challenge per Edward Fudge. With the above as foundation, I do want to look at his writings. The man was an extensive author and proponent of the annihilation position. He has quoted the church fathers extensively to suggest that what he believes and what he's writing about has a legacy connected back to them. So by claiming solidarity with him, Fudge presents the case that his views are in line with the original faith content that was handed down. And I do acknowledge, and I want to make this clear, that one can read the fathers and conclude that they were conditionalist. I do acknowledge that. The soul, of course, conditionalist means the soul is not immortal. Uh, it will not be granted life for eternity to live in hell. This is the annihilation position. I also want to acknowledge that you can read the very same fathers and conclude they were traditionalists, which is the soul is immortal and will live on eternally in heaven or hell. And this comes down to basically two issues, hermeneutics and theological content. That's really what this debate centers upon. And so this brings me to fudge again. I'm going to critique the fire that consumes a biblical and historical study of the doctrines of the final examination to demonstrate that fudge 
I don't think he makes a case for prominent church fathers being conditionalists. The approach here is to review Fudge's understanding of the content in certain fathers to show his work is somewhat suspect. So his work, The Fire cons That Consumes, it does provide five chapters on the early church supporting annihilationism, one chapter on the Middle Ages, four chapters from the Reformers to the Contemporary Church, which I found fascinating, all describing the various peoples associated with those eras supporting annihilationism. So to take fudge at face value simply means that by 200 AD, until now, for roughly 2,100 years, something like that, means that Christianity has continued to misread the church fathers. That's his claim. The reformers also, and current evangelical scholarship, were misreading him. It's an incredible claim, but that is the basis of his book. So to understand him, let's uh, look at how he treats three different men, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus, and Tertullian. And I really wanted to look at uh, Justin Martyr, but I don't have time. We're going to look at a quote from Basel and one from Arnobius. All right, Ignatius of Antioch. Fudge gives a concise background of, of Ignatius' martyrdom. After citing his execution, he moves on to an explanation of his writings, particularly the Ephesians, the Trillians, the Magnesians, and I hope I pronounced this right. I know it as Smyrna, but Smyrnaeans, those people there, he includes them. Um, the letter to the Ephesians, I have a quote here, do not err, my brethren, James 1 verse 16, those, who cor those that corrupt families shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, if then those who do this as respect the flesh have suffered death, how much more shall this be the case with anyone who corrupts by wicked doctrine the faith of God for which Jesus Christ was crucified? Such an one becoming defiled in his way shall go away into everlasting fire and shall uh, every one that hearkens unto him. By the way, the Twitter world with evangelicals is rough. It doesn't compare to the fathers. Those guys were bloodthirsty. They went after each other. Fudge quotes the Ignatian, uh, Ignatius' letter to the Magnesians, chapter 5, verse 1, saying this, Seeing then all things have an end, uh, these two things are simultaneously set before us, life and death, and everyone shall go into his own place. And he also addresses a letter to the Trillians, quoting chapter 2, For since you are subject to the bishop as to Jesus Christ, you appear to... Me, you appear to me to live not after the manner of men, but according to Christ, who died for us in order, believing by his death that you may escape from death. And so the goal of Dr. Fudge is to rightly declare that Ignatius understands the contrasting terms of life and death found in the scriptures. Fudge attempts to prove that Ignatius is consistent in his understanding of the terms. And this is where the argument gets interesting. Fudge, I do believe, makes some assumptions about Ignatius that cannot be substantiated. Ignatius speaks of Jesus' death and the sinner's final death in the same sentence, and I'm quoting Fudge here, with no indication that the word has more than one meaning. If Fudge is correct, then the word death has only one meaning, but he doesn't apply it consistently in his writings. And I'll say more about his interpretive scheme in a moment. But in other words, if the word death means eternal annihilation for the sinner, then consistently Fudge has to address the meaning of death when it applies to Jesus Christ. He is not consistent here. Death means annihilation for the ones who sin, but it doesn't mean annihilation for Jesus Christ. Well, if he doesn't apply one meaning, then of course it has to have two different meanings. So should he apply that meaning to Jesus, it would simply mean that Jesus was annihilated by the cross never to live again. And Fudge will not go there, and I don't blame him. So let's sum up his argument. He adheres to the position that death means annihilation for the sinner. He claims in the same sentence that the word death cannot have two meanings. The sinner will die to never live again because God will annihilate him, but he stops the argument right there. He does not apply the same meaning to the Lord for various reasons, it would be unbiblical. Fudge's refusal to apply this meaning consistently and inadvertently means that he has undermined his own position. If it truly has one meaning, then it has to apply to all parties. 
He knows that if he applies the meaning of annihilationism to the Lord's death, it would result in an unbiblical Christianity, as there could no, uh, no longer be the possibility of a resurrection. And so quite simply, I do think Fudge is picking and choosing the application of meanings, and this time it kind of caught up with him when he chose not to apply it consistently. So regardless of the fact that he builds the case for the word death, meaning annihilation, and even though he says Ignatius uses that way, Without different meanings, he cannot apply it to the cross of Christ. I think it's clear that Ignatius never made such a claim as Fudge is asserting. Fudge forces a meaning on the ancient author that I don't think is there. Now, I do know Chris will probably contradict this later this afternoon. uh, And that's good. I want to hear that as well. Um, Fudge cannot apply this, though, consistently. And that is my biggest issue is if it has that one meaning for the one person and it's only one meaning, then it should be the same meaning for all people. All right, and that brings us to Irenaeus. Fudge, along with Leroy Froome, depicts Irenaeus as embracing annihilationism. And the famous quote from Irenaeus is against heresies, book 5, chapter 27. Let me read that for you. But separation from God is death, and separation from light is darkness, and separation from God consists in the loss of all benefits. Keep that word in mind. Separation from God consists in the loss of all benefits which he has in store. Those, therefore, who cast away by apostasy these aforementioned things, being in fact destitute of all good, do experience every kind of punishment. God, however, does not punish them immediately himself, but that punishment falls upon them because they are destitute of all that is good. Interesting quote here. Now, Irenaeus continues. Now, how does he define the good? Good things are eternal and without end with God. And therefore, the loss of these is also eternal and never-ending. It is this matter, just as occurs in the case of a flood of light, those who have blinded themselves or been blinded by others are forever deprived of the enjoyment of light. If you're blind, you cannot see light. It is not, however, that this light has inflicted upon them the penalty of blindness, but it is that the blindness itself has brought calamity upon them. You cannot blame the light for a person being blind. And therefore the Lord declared, He that believes in me is not condemned, John 3, 18. That is, is not separated from God, for he is united to God in faith. On the other hand, he says, He that believes is not condemned. Uh, He that believes not is condemned already. I'm sorry, I misquoted that. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, that is, he separated himself for God for his own accord. One of my frustrations with the fathers, and this is really has been a frustration, is we, we contemporize every other language to English. We don't do that with the church fathers. We leave them in old English, and it's hard to read them, guys. It's a project some of you need to work on. <laughs> All right, Irenaeus. When describing the loss of the good benefits that God offers via, via separateness from him, or separation from him... He uses the words eternal, never-ending, forever deprived of enjoying light. These words speak of eternity without end, referring to the final destiny of lost people. Now the question becomes, what did he mean by that? Fudge concludes that the loss of benefits must include the loss of existence. I get the connection. The problem is that Irenaeus does not address that particular issue. To support his own conclusions, Fudge must assume a different meaning for the word eternal, never-ending, and forever deprived. And this is the classic case of reading into a text something that is not there. He did not say loss of existence, but loss of benefit. Plain and simple. Loss of benefits. Fudge must conclude that the phrase loss of benefits actually means loss of existence. But there is no warrant for that in Irenaeus' writings that justifies that conclusion. Second, the conflation of these two statements, and they are lengthy, allow differing definitions to take place in order to support a conclusion conclusion that is not warranted from the text. I do believe Fudge is somewhat misreading, well, not just somewhat, he is misreading Irenaeus on this issue. Froome... I do bring him in. I told the pastor I did. 
commenting on the same passage in the chapter entitled Conditionalism in the Early Church, basically follows the same logic, or actually Fudge follows the logic of Froome. Froome states the incorrigibly wicked are consigned to eternal punishment, which he explains in the complete cessation of being or existence. And this results in the end of all evil. Irenaeus did not say that. Okay, He did not say that. Froome goes on to summarize his understanding of Irenaeus' argument. Froome writes, his argument in a sentence was this, to be deprived of the benefit of existence is the greatest punishment. And right there is the problem. He never said that. But look at how they're importing a meaning into what he did not say. His argument is this, I'll rephrase it, to be deprived of the benefit of existence is the greatest punishment, and to be deprived of them forever is to suffer eternal punishment. Froome's summary is accurate, but his follow-up by interpretation is somewhat misleading. Again, Froome states, the incorrigible wicked are consigned to eternal punishment, which is cessation of being or existence. The chastisement of the wicked are eternal in the effects, because God's benefits are eternal. I'm going to critique Froome for just a moment. The first issue, and I've kind of mentioned it, is that Irenaeus never refers to the non-saved as being annihilated. Froome, in order to be consistent with his position, is forced to redefine the meaning of eternal punishment along with the phrase loss of benefits. In his mind, the punishment is the annihilation of the person. That does not mean it was Irenaeus' mindset. This is Froome. So the effect of the punishment, according to Froome, would be eternal, meaning that God will annihilate the person as a means of punishment. Well, the problem with that, it's not stated by Irenaeus in taking Irenaeus at face value. Okay, remember we want to take fudge at face value? Well, let's take Irenaeus at face value. He writes of the person being eternally punished but never annihilated. I do think Froome forces a meaning onto Irenaeus' words. The second problem with uh, Froome is the confused writing style. And maybe it's my problem, okay? I'm not going to blame Froome for this. Maybe I didn't understand Froome well enough. I do believe he conflates two separate issues into one. He stated that it is a benefit to be eternally annihilated. Really? For who? Who receives the loss of benefits if one is annihilated? Does the lost person receive a benefit in that punishment? Is the said benefit applicable to the redeemed? I don't believe Irenaeus even addressed this issue, much less, but I do raise the question is, how can it be a benefit that Irenaeus didn't really address to say that a person is annihilated? Any suggestion that annihilation is a benefit is left undefined. The third problem with Froome is that he equates punishment, which is designed to be punitive, and annihilation, which is designed to be a termination of existence, as somewhat equivalent. I do believe he confuses the means of punishment with the effects of punishment and states they are the same. So where does Irenaeus state that the means of punishment are temporal? Well, he doesn't. Again, Froome, along with Fudge, makes some forced assumptions to the meaning of Irenaeus. Now, to be fair, I will admit that one can read Irenaeus' confessions, and I've got the quote here, book 1, chapter 10, verse 1, as positing an eternal destruction of the wicked. But you could also read it the same way as positing eternal damnation. All right. That brings us to Tertullian. Tertullian is a latter church father who rightly belongs to the second century apologist era. Um, that's E-R-A, in case you can't understand my... Texas accent, not, not a problem, uh, but a time period there. <laughs> Sorry about that. The apologists were those who defended the faith uh, against heretical attacks upon Christianity. And this alone makes Tertullian a worthy investigation of his writings who not only defended Christianity, but helped to define Christianity amidst the challenges. And I really like uh, Tertullian's writings for that very purpose. We're going to look at a couple of his works, The Resurrection of the Flesh, because uh, Fudge does this. Tertullian's book, The Resurrection of the Flesh, references the immortality of the soul and the eternal killing of the soul. Fudge quotes chapter 35. Uh, interesting quote uh, of all the ones Fudge picked. I was surprised he did this, but he, he quotes Tertullian at, uh, accurately. 
If therefore anyone shall violently suppose that the destruction of the soul and the flesh in hell amounts to a final annihilation of the two substances and not to their uh, penal treatment as if they were consumed and not punished, let him recollect that the fire of hell is eternal, expressly announced as an everlasting penalty. And let them then admit that it is from this circumstances that this never-ending killing is more formidable than merely a human murder, which is only temporal. Tertullian is commenting on the famous phrase of Matthew 10, 28, which says this, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Tertullian earlier comments on Matthew 10, 28, says this, Here then we have a recognition of the natural immortality of the soul which cannot be killed by men, and the mortality of the body, which may be killed. Whence we learn that the resurrection of the dead is a resurrection of the flesh. For unless it were raised again, it would be impossible for the flesh to be killed in hell. He's talking about a resurrection. For since both substances are set before us, that body and soul are destroyed in hell, a distinction is obviously made between the two, or else there's no point in a resurrection. We are left to understand the body to that which is tangible to us, that is the flesh, which is uh, and will be destroyed in hell. Since it does not rather fear being destroyed by God, so it will also be reinforced or restored to eternal life since it preferred to be killed by human hands. An interesting commentary he makes upon that, uh, that passage. But he's making the strong argument that there is a distinction between body and soul, hence the warning of Matthew chapter 10. The body is corrupt, mortal, it's going to die, whereas the soul is incorrupt, immortal. That's the the reason you should fear God. So let's summarize Tertullian's argument. His argument is predicated upon a natural reading of Matthew 10, 28. He does not eisegete the scriptures, which means he does not force a meaning into them. He reads them with a plain sense of meaning that there, is, there are two kinds of fear. You should not fear man, but you should fear God. That's basically the meaning there. First, he states that the body is mortal. Nothing wrong there. The flesh can be destroyed by humanity, sickness, or violent natural means. You know, tornado, flood, whatever. His second point is, though, that the soul cannot be destroyed because it is immortal. You don't fear a man because he can destroy your soul. He can't. That's the warning. That is, the soul is on after the death of the flesh. The third point is that God must raise the flesh in order to fulfill the meaning of Matthew 10, 28. If God does not raise the flesh, it would be impossible to kill the flesh in hell, which is what the warning states. So the basis of the unbeliever's judgment by the Lord is the resurrection of the unbelieving dead. If this were not the case, if mortality... Uh, is not the issue in uh, uh, being considered here, um, then we don't really actually understand Matthew 10. And I think Fudge does understand it, by the way. Uh, He does get a little unclear as he applies it, though. The fourth point that Tertullian believes is the contrast found in Matthew 10 is exactly that the earthly body can be destroyed, but cannot be destroyed in hell. Okay? This is Tertullian we're dealing with. Thus, one must fear God who is capable of destroying both body and soul. Now, Tertullian's point is there's no sense in the warning at all of Matthew 10, 18 um, if kill and destroy would be tantamount to the same concept. Thus, there would be no need for divine judgment making the warning invalid. Now, I want you to notice how I phrase the last sentence. I do not argue against kill and destroy being synonyms. The argument I made about Tertullian, and I believe the Lord's point, has to do with agency. The person who kills the body is human. The point is, why be afraid of humanity? They cannot cannot kill the soul, only the body. This strongly refers to the eternality of the soul. If a human being cannot kill the soul then that says something about the soul itself. If they cannot kill the soul, then the soul must be immortal. Why does this follow a logical pattern? Well, the warning itself. Who can destroy the soul? Only God can do that. Now, at this point, most annihilationists would agree with this dichotomy here. They would say, amen, only God can destroy the soul. 
Well, Jones, doesn't that argue for annihilationism? I'm ready for college football about you, so I'm going to quote a famous um, commentator, Lee Corsco. You ever heard of him? Okay. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> okay. To say that the soul is annihilated in hell makes the punishment aspect of sin finite. It also makes hell finite. But in Matthew 10, 28, seems to be arguing for punishment as being eternal and the reward of eternal heaven for the righteous. Unless that is true, there's no need for the warning. Why the warning for finite punishment? It does not make sense. I said to Jonathan last night, he quoted some of his friends from Arkansas, which is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, I'm just kidding, Jonathan. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Some of his friends would say, all right, I'm willing to live like I want to. If I have to spend a thousand years in hell to be annihilated, I would probably join them. If I knew my time, even though a thousand years is a lot longer than I'm going to live on earth, but think about it, my existence will come to an end. I would probably say, all right, I'm the same type of personality. Let's live today. Tomorrow we'll face the consequences. And those consequences will be rough, but think about it. They'll come to an end. Okay. Per fudge, damn spirits would undergo conscience torment for a time, but then they are annihilated so their punishment is finite. They have no being. This begs the question of the atonement for those who enjoy heaven. If sin is finite, then wouldn't the atonement also be finite? Yet the saints are to enjoy eternal life in Matthew 10, 28. That is the basis of the warning seems to be a process of duration. Now, let me be pointed here. Fudge has to argue that those receiving punishment are annihilated, but what about the saints? Is heaven a duration, or is it a once-and-for-all concise punctiliar act like hell is in his concept? Fudge would not argue the approach using basically the same words for the redeemed. This makes his argument suspect. For that matter, fudge must have an infinite sacrifice for finite sins. If sin is finite, then a creature could atone for sin, which is the process of the Old Testament. Fudge cannot allow this, but he will not address it either. He will not address the atonement as he only argues the penalty for the rejection of grace is finite. Furthermore, Fudge claims that non-conditionalists will not review Matthew 10, 28. And I thought that was an interesting claim. Fudge argues that non-conditionalists want to make destroy mean alive. Valid consideration there, by the way. He writes, we see in Matthew's account, Jesus equates kill and destroy, making them interchangeable. This is not surprising to the ordinary person in normal discourse, but it flies in the face of traditionalists, which is another word for non-conditionalists, who also define destroy as a lie, but wishing it not to be. I thought that was an accurate quote by Fudge. I want to give him credit for that. Yet Fudge knows Tertullian, Tertullian's argument very well. He even admits that Tertullian understands the meaning of Matthew 10, 28 as contrasting the temporal earthly body with the eternal body located in hell. Fudge writes this about Tertullian. If the souls of the, uh, even the wicked people are immortal and destined to live forever, and if earthly sin will be punished by what the Bible calls eternal fire, the only conclusion Tertullian can reach is that the wicked will endure conscious or ending torment. Fudge understands what Tertullian is writing. The interesting issue with Fudge is that regardless of crediting Tertullian, For representing a consistent position, he critiques him for not understanding Matthew 10, 28. Fudge states that if Tertullian is to be understood as embracing eternal conscious torment in hell, he must not take Matthew 10, 28 literally. Fudge accuses Tertullian of denying the literal meaning of the scripture. It's an incredible claim. Tertullian, per Fudge, is the one who is wrong on the issue, in my opinion, but Fudge never considers the fact that he could be wrong, and Tertullian has built a solid case, which I think he did. And that brings us to the apology. Tertullian's apology is probably one of the best apologetic works you can read on Christianity. It it really is outstanding. 
It's a defense of individual Christians who should have the same right to worship their God in a pagan society that would not allow them to worship him without fear of threat or even death. And he writes this against the face of Roman law at that time. It's a wonderful work. He addresses the current philosopher's opinion of eternality, which I found interesting in chapter 45. And this is what Tertullian says. No doubt about it, we who receive our rewards under the judgment of an all-seeing God who look forward to eternal punishment from, uh, from him for sin. I don't know about that. I mean, he's a little rough there. We, we alone make real effort to attain a blameless light, a life under the influence of our ampler knowledge, the impossibility of concealment, the greatness of the threatened torment, not merely long enduring, but everlasting. Fearing him whom to, he too should fear for who the fearing judges, even God I mean, not the proconsul. In other words, you need to fear God because not only can he give you eternal life, he can give you eternal, everlasting, conscious torment. That's basically Tertullian's point. Tertullian uses the expression eternal punishment, and he defines the meaning this way. It is not merely long enduring, but everlasting. Now, I've read and reread Tertullian on this issue. There's really no other way to read him with any other significant meaning, and Fudge knows that. But Fudge is misrepresenting Tertullian by stating that Tertullian believes in the, in the immortality of the, of the soul, To the extent that the soul does not need to be saved. Now, I want you to watch what Fudge does here. Tertullian does believe that the soul does not need salvation, but only the body. So I'm going to give Fudge a pass on that critique. I think he's absolutely right. Fudge slips in another issue, though, in his writings and conflates it with the argument against conditionalism. And this is where I think Fudge is misleading. This is what I call the old bait and switch moves. He cannot prove that Tertullian is a conditionalist because he's not. He does not admit this, so he condemns uh, Tertullian using Henry Constable as ammunition to state that Tertullian is hedging and using equivocation of language, and he quotes that on page 270. Regardless, Fudge is being academically and morally dishonest here. No matter how hard he tries, Fudge cannot make Tertullian a conditionalist. So he condemns him in another theological area, uh, area, saying he's a man of extremes. Now, I don't want you to miss what he does here. Fudge changes the topic in his writings on Tertullian. He moves from eternal damnation to Tertullian's concept of salvation. Fudge is trying to show that if Tertullian is wrong, Tertullian is wrong in one area, salvation, then he must be wrong in everything he's written. This is a logical fallacy known as irrelevant conclusion, or more popularly known as the red herring argument. I've seen this a lot, and so have you. Christians do this, so we can't trust any of them. That's usually how it's used. Okay. So for you not to miss this, he changes the topic condemns him for one, and follows that condemnation all the way through. It's a deliberate attempt to change the subject or divert the argument from the real question at issue that Fudge raised himself, and that is annihilationism. So he places the emphasis on soteriology, uses Henry Constable, and now all of a sudden Tertullian is an extreme person. This is the one area I was most disappointed in Fudge was this area with Tertullian. Fudge does not review chapter 47, though, of Tertullian's Apology. And the reason is simple. It is a statement about eternal damnation that contradicts Fudge's opinion. When chapter 47 is uh, reviewed, it gives better insight into Fudge's premise that through Tertullian, Plato joined the church. The emphasis here is that Fudge believes that in that book, Hell, a Final Word that it was Tertullian who introduced this shift via Plato. Okay, Fudge claims that Tertullian brought Platonic philosophy into the church, and thus the meaning of the immortality of the soul was introduced. This is much to question on how much Platonic thought impacted Tertullian, I will admit that, and this needs to be heavily considered in lieu of the fact that Tertullian had embraced Montanism, which is also an issue, Montanism were extremely um, legalistic people. So the theological concept of Montanism is morally rigid of the person. The fact that Fudge credits Tertullian with introducing Platonic philosophy and shifting the focus of the church away from conditionalism 
is kind of a logical fallacy known as false cause argument. There is no proof that Tertullian is responsible for moving the church away from conditionalism in any direction. How can I be certain? Because the argument is also guilty of affirming the consequence as the argument itself assumes that conditionalism was the normally accepted theological position. And I don't think it was. Fudge assumes that Tertullian is responsible for the church embracing eternal damnation because of his background in philosophy. Fudge's premise allows him to connect theological dots from Tertullian to Clement to Origen then to Augustine on to Anselm, the Reformers, even to American Christianity, pages 152 to 157 uh, in the book, The Final Word. If this argument were true, and I've already stated this, then we would have to no option but to conclude that Christianity has been deceived and deceiving itself for 2,000 years. Thankfully, Tertullian gives, Tertullian gives insight into this relationship between philosophy and theology in chapter 47. I want you to listen to what Tertullian, who was a philosopher, said about philosophy. What poet or sophist has not drunk at the fountain of the prophets, the Old Testament? Hence, accordingly, the philosophers watered their arid minds so that it is the things they have from us which brings us into comparison with them. Now keep in mind, he's a philosopher. He's saying their content came right out of the Old Testament. For this reason, I imagine philosophy was banished by certain states. I mean by the Thebians, the Spartans also, and the Argives. Its disciples sought to initiate our doctrines. And ambitious, as I have said, of glory and eloquence alone, if they fell upon anything in the collection of sacred writings which displeased them, in their own peculiar style of research, they perverted it to serve their purpose. For they had no adequate faith in their destiny to keep them from changing them, nor had they any sufficient understanding of them, either as being still at the same time under a veil, even obscured to the Jews themselves, whose particular possession they seemed to be. For so too, if the truth was distinguished by simplicity... The more on the account of the fastidious of man, too proud to believe, set to altering it, so that even when they found certain, they made uncertain by their admixtures. They mixed it with their current thought. Finding a simple revelation of God, they proceeded to dispute about him, not as he had revealed himself, but turned aside to debate his proponents, his nature, his attributes. What Tertullian is saying is they got their content from us, not vice versa. Now, I have no problem if someone says that Tertullian did try to integrate philosophy with theology. I think he did. I think it is a correct statement concerning Tertullian. I do believe that was his approach. My problem lies in the fact that Fudge assumes that Tertullian embraced philosoph uh, philosophic reasoning as the authority above the scriptures when that is simply not the case. That premise has not been proven. In fact, Tertullian contradicts that statement. So, from this short review, it's hard for Fudge to make the case of conditionalism, that annihilation was widely accepted by the church fathers. No doubt some did embrace that. I understand that. But it was not accepted by the majority. And I find it interesting that he critiqued the most prominent philosophers, to, uh, church fathers, to prove that. And I wish there were more time to look at Justin Martyr, as I said, but there's not. So, let me go to Basel. Now, Basel becomes important here. He makes a strange statement that for a few years I tried to figure out what he meant by it. Um, and then when I read Fudge, I, I immediately picked up on it. So I do owe Fudge a big thank you for this one. Basil of Caesarea is known as a Cappadocian father. He's also known as Basil the Great. His work on the Trinity, brilliant, just brilliant. He was born, now catch this, in 329. 329. A future character, and we're going to look at a few moments, is Arnobius who died in 330. Those dates become important. Basel began his ministry in the late 350s. He died in 379, around the age of 50 years old. His ministry only lasted 20 years, but he impacted the ancient country of Turkey significantly. You ought to see what he did in that country with his church, that, what he led his church to do. But he also impacted Christianity as a whole. Basel's work, Rules Briefly Treated, deals with the subject of everlasting punishment, and he raises the question himself does everlasting punishment end? And I thought, why in the world is he you know, doing that? I never connected it with Arnobius. In one place, the Lord declares that these shall go to eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. 
And in another place he sends some to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. And speaks elsewhere to the fire of Gehenna, uh, specifying that it is a place where their worm dies not, and the fire is never extinguished, uh, Mark 9. And even of old, through the prophet, it was foretold that their worm will not die, nor will their fire be extinguished, Isaiah 66. Although these and the like declarations are to be found in numerous places of divinely inspired scripture, and I'm still quoting Basel, now he, I, I told you, these guys go after each other really harsh, and this is one of the areas. It is one of the artifices of the devil. <laughs> okay, He's a little cruel here. Uh, and I'm going to explain why in a second, uh, but they, they shouldn't have done it, but they did. That many forgetting these and other such statements utter, and utterances of the Lord ascribe an end to punishment. Now, as I said, I've been reading the fathers for a long time, and I never read them the way Fudge does, and I don't think he makes his case. But I will acknowledge Basel did see them as conditionalist. Okay, He did say that. So that they can sin more boldly. This was his statement. If, however, there were going to be an end of eternal punishment, there would likewise be an end to eternal life. If one cannot conceive of an end to that life, how are we supposed that there will be an an end to an eternal punishment? The qualification of eternal is ascribed equally to both of them. And he's right about that. That was my point earlier. For these are going, he says, into eternal punishment, and however, these are going into eternal life. If we profess that these... um, These things we must recognize that he shall be flogged with many stripes and he shall be flogged with few stripes refer not an end to a distinction of punishment, but it refers to the process of punishment. Now that quote has always been fascinating to me. Right or wrong, he attributes the understanding of scriptural teaching of annihilation to Satan. I, I don't think he should have done that, but he did. But he also did that with Arianism. He said if you don't believe the eternality of Jesus Christ, that's of Satan himself. And so he conflates the two. We've got to be honest with these guys, okay? Let's don't color them. Let's just let them speak, and we don't agree with them. But Basel's dates are also revealing to shed some light on the contempt for this doctrine. He attributed Arianism to the work of Satan as they misrepresented the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit would not lead a Christian to embrace that about our Savior. And so these guys were just going at each other. Basel's claim is based upon the Greek construct of Matthew 25, 46, The word eternal is applied to two different people, but indicates their eternal abodes. To state that the lost person will be annihilated must mean Satan influenced the interpretation of the people who are eternally damned. Basel sees this as a satanic attack upon the scriptures. That's really where he's going with this. Another interesting feature is that Basel is a pastor theologian. In his work, he is writing as a monastic reformer. Yet he comments on annihilationism from a pastor's point of view. He states that the doctrine allows one to sin more boldly. The one who sins more boldly will receive more punishment. This argues for a process, not a punctiliar action. How can God destroy a soul with more or less integrity if it's punctiliar? If one receives many stripes and one receives fewer, how can annihilation fulfill that claim? Does he use more intensity? It it just doesn't make sense. The meaning of flogging with many stripes or fewer stripes refers to the type of punishment received, not an ending to the punishment, which was Basel's argument. The one receiving many stripes incurred more wrath because of the sins committed. Obviously, the concept of duration of of, uh, punishment is in mind, along with the quantity of one's punishment. And that brings us to the strange case of Arnobius. I like Arnobius. i got to be honest with you about it. Now, you heard an eternal conscious torment person say he liked Arnobius. This is supposed to be the arch heretic, but uh, I I really like him for several reasons. Basel's strange statement, I think, is in reference to the case of Arnobius of Sicca 1. Now, I cannot prove that, okay? I cannot prove it. It's just an assumption. You and I and the rest of the watching world can definitely say that Arnobius was a conditionalist. He taught the mortality of the soul the need for redemption, the consequences of rejecting divine grace. We would probably say amen to every one of his sermons. The conditional nature of the soul meant for Arnobius that the soul must have redemption or annihilation awaited the lost person. 
Arnobius seemed to have rejected what I think the biblical doctrine of the immortality of the soul. He rejected that in favor, strong, strangely enough, for a more platonic view of Christianity. And Earl Ellis makes that case even against fudge. Dr. Ellis comments on the work of Arnobius and comes to a vastly different conclusion than Fudge does. Ellis states this, both Arnobius and Athanasius build their arguments more on philosophy than on a biblical foundation. Now, this is a significant issue as Fudge argues that the conditionalist position is biblical. Ellis seems to think that the conditional, uh, conditionalist position of the church fathers is built upon a philosophical framework. Please note that Ellis is no friend to traditionalists, even though he and I agree on this. He is, he is not a traditionalist by any stretch of the imagination. Yet, in stating, in, uh, yet, instead of stating that the fathers who embrace conditional mortality are biblical, Ellis states the opposite. If they embraced conditional immortality, they're being more philosophical. Whereas Fudge argued the exact opposite, conditional mortality, in his opinion, was always New Testament doctrine, and Tertullian brought in the chains when he brought in Platonic philosophy. Ellis states, no, it was philosophy that did this. Okay, It wasn't uh, the scriptures. So they are at odds over one another. Now back to Arnobius. I do respect him for standing against the current. I like that about a guy who would stand up and say, no, you guys are wrong, this is right. I know it doesn't sit too well in our culture, but these guys um, really, life or death for them. And it's kind of a hard world for us to understand. We've got to understand the time frame we're looking at was when Christianity was illegal. To even utter the name Jesus Christ as Lord was a death sentence. Okay. It didn't even become legal to 325. So we're looking at a time period of over 300 years where being a Christian meant you were separated from your family and at worst they were killed and so were you. Uh, and so this did have life or death consequences for them. It was at 325, well actually 3, 312 I believe it was, uh, that Christianity was finally tolerated in a legal sense. And so once a person took a theological position, you could either stand with the, the consensus of the church or stand against it. But either way, you were standing against the law of the land at that time. Now, I like him for that. Um, for He's not afraid to take his position. He writes this, But what man does not see that which is immortal, which is simply not a unity of soul and body? He does not believe in the immortality of the soul. He cannot be subject to any pain that, on the contrary, cannot immortal suffer at all, which does suffer pain, basically. His point is that the soul does not undergo pain. Now, I'm not going to debate Arnobius here, but he knows of mental anguish, depression, and uh, mind-body solutions. I'm not going to argue those positions are from the soul, but you can't say they're from the body either. It seems to be mental or emotional. The mind may function quite well, but the body may not. Stephen Hawking is a great example of that. His mind functioned well, but he was wheelchair-bound the majority of his life. Many athletes can attest to this. When they retire, most athletes make this statement, I can still mentally play the game, but my body won't allow me to. Uh, and so we understand that. You can mentally function well, but the body not respond. And vice versa. The body may function quite well, but mentally there's problems. So the bottom line for me with Anobius is that I need more information on him before I can assess his work. So I just want to say, suffice it to say, he is a conditionalist. Now what happened to him? It's very interesting. Um, this slide right here has an asterisk on it. And I'm going to make an appeal. I have read two different authors that said he, Arnobius, was condemned at the Second Council of Constantinople 553. I even emailed one of those authors because Chris had questioned me about it. And I had to admit, as I was writing this, I felt uncomfortable because I'd never read that before. When I emailed that one author, I've yet to hear an answer back. Where did he get his source for the condemnation of um, Arnobius at 553? I don't think that happened. Okay, A lot of miscommunication. Uh, go, go back one moment. A lot of miscommunication about Arnobius in that uh, council. We do know origin was condemned and universalism conde was condemned. I find no evidence that Arnobius was condemned. So if you're here contemplating any work in the Fathers or any other type of work, go back to the original sources and, and represent them fairly. Okay, this, this writing, now this may have been me misunderstanding the contemporary author, but that's pretty much what he said, and I just can't find it. He was condemned at the Lateran Council of 1513. 
One must remember that Arnobius died in 330 AD, which is one year after Basel was born. And those dates are significant. Yarborough comments on Arnobius. He says this, in fact, even a source friendly to conditionalists admit that this is not until Arnobius that we find the first explicit defense of the annihilation of the ungodly souls in hell. Now, of course, being an ETC guy, I would agree with that because I do think Fudge has been misreading the fathers. Arnobius, this is kind of cruel too, is among the least biblically grounded early church fathers. And you find this um, in the writings, uh, Hell Under Fire, and they are quoting David Hilborn's The Nature of Hell. This quote actually refers to Arnobius as one who introduced annihilationism into Christianity. If I'm wrong about Fudge and these other guys did, if I'm wrong, then what this says is Arnobius is the fall guy. If I'm right about it, Arnobius is still the fall guy. He cannot win this debate either way. The condemnation of Arnobius also means that the whole of Christianity found his writings outside of Christian orthodoxy. Now, the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, which is the standard reference, states this. Though this opinion held, had a solitary single representative in the 4th century, African Christian author Anobius, it was never held in Christendom until recent times except in isolated cases of philosophical speculation, and it was formally condemned at the Fifth Lateran Council in uh, 1513, I think. Yeah, 1513. In the 19th century, however, it found favor with many thinkers as a possible way of accounting for the fate of impenitent, wicked, without accepting either the orthodox doctrine of eternal punishment or the originistic theory of universalism. Now, I like this. Interesting. That doesn't mean these guys who wrote the dictionary are correct, but look what they did. They're saying Origen is out of line, keeping with his condemnation, and Arnobius is out of line because he was condemned. So the teaching of the mortality of the soul is generally considered to be opposed to the Christian doctrine of man, to the dignity and responsibility of the human soul. Uh, this is under the uh, uh, definition of conditional immortality. So the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Church is a standard reference for Christian uh, thinking, historical definitions, all of that. And even though Fudge and others claim legacy from the church fathers, there's, I don't think, really evidence to support it. Another interesting quote from B.B. Warfield, which I, uh, I adore, a Princeton theologian. He said, some confusion has arisen in tracing the history of the annihilationist theories from confounding them with enunciations by the early church fathers of the essential doctrine and the soul is not self-existent, but owes as it continues its being to the will of God. The earliest appearance of genuinely annihilation theory in extant Christian literature is to be found apparently in the African apologist Arnobius. And I'm indebted to Ronald Rothenberger for this quote. Past theologians recognize that the founder of annihilationism is, um, past and present I should say, it really is Arnobius who articulated it very well. It is not found, I don't believe Fudge makes the case within the tradition of the church fathers. Okay? Um, just for the record, the Baptist faith and message, of course, uh, claims that, uh, that hell is enduring. And so do all the creeds, uh, unless you reinterpret the definition. Now, last two things here, and then I'm done. I know it's been a long presentation, and thank you for your patience. I do have some issues with Fudge's interpretive problems. Conditionalists try to support their argument based upon a range of meanings that are often secondary meanings instead of basic primary definition. Case in point is the word eternal. If Fudge truly believes that the eternal wicked will be annihilated, he does, as I said, he doesn't apply it consistently. You have derivatives. He doesn't apply it to eternal righteous. You have derivatives of Ionius, Ion, and eternal without beginning or end. Fudge uses the words to indicate a finality of the process or a finality of consequences. Yet punishment requires conscious existence. Think about it. If annihilation is punishment, and it certainly is, then that person has to have some form of existence in order for annihilation to be carried out. Yet punishment requires conscious existence for God to punish the body and soul. There has to be the resurrection of the body with the immortal soul or at least the mortality of the soul. All this indicates a process of judgment, not a process to judgment. 
And this actually raises the second problem. Conditionalists know that the word eternal means without end. How can you argue for a finite ending of the body that has been raised to unite with an immortal soul? You cannot. Fudge hinges his argument on the mortality of the soul, bringing in that thought that the soul is not immortal. Therefore, he and other conditionalists argue that the meaning of eternal destruction is the effect of the punishment, not the process of a punishment. Now, there's an analogy that will help us understand this. When a convicted criminal receives a life sentence, this means that the process is punitive for the duration of his life. The criminal will never be set free to harm society at large and can only harm society within his confinement, if then. The conditionalists will argue this actually supports annihilationism. Uh, when the criminal dies, the punishment ends. Not so fast. If the soul is eternal, then punishment can never end, which is, I think, the meaning of Matthew 28, the reason for the warning. The only reason for the Lord to raise the unbeliever's body is for punitive action. Keep in mind the body's already dead, so he requires the body to be united with the soul. And most conditionalists will agree with that. Here is the problem. If the soul is mortal, it must be resurrected unless they defeat their own position by stating that the soul lives on past the body. Now think about it. If they believe the soul is conditional, let me restate this. If the soul is mortal, but they believe it's con- and they believe that, then they must believe it is resurrected as well. If it's connected that strongly to the body, because if the soul is past the body, that's a case for the immortality of the soul. And they can't get around that philosophical reasoning. If they do argue such, then their argument for the eternal soul is already in place. It denies their own position. If in their view the soul is beyond death of the body, then at what point does the soul demonstrate its mortality? Mortality means that an entity will die on its own. And this is a hard issue, a hard philosophical issue for conditionalists right here. So for the above reasonings, the philosophical reasonings, the traditionalists traditionalists contend that the soul is immortal and will be punished with the raised body. And you see this biblical motif in Genesis 3.22 where God acknowledged that a person can live forever in an unsaved body and soul. In that scenario, God banished Adam and Eve who could eat of the tree and live forever. So God banished them so they would not do that. This verse argues for a state of existence that knows no time limits. Quality is not the key here, but duration is in view. The use of the word destroy and kill are used by conditionalists to argue annihilationism. The argument is that destroy, uh, destroy and kill simply mean total destruction of the person. Conditionalists correctly state that punishment in the Old Testament is often associated with extinction or annihilation, and they are correct. Douglas Moo has argued that destroy and kill can also mean loss of function or productivity. What is destroyed is life as we know it in the world. But note that most evangelical annihilationists posit that unbelievers exist for some time after death, so clearly they cannot argue the language of destruction When applied to physical death means extinction, if they really do believe in annihilation. This, of course, this argument for extinction after the unbeliever's resurrection is difficult to make if they believe in conditional mortality. The word does not take on different meanings pending the status of the unbeliever. Again, conditionalists face a real philosophical and theological dilemma with this issue. Moo goes on to argue that the meaning of destroy can mean loss of function, especially in view of the land as it's used in the Old Testament. The land is still there, but it is destroyed so that produce and vegetation uh, vegetation are not sustainable. My great-grandfather was a sharecropper uh, in North Texas, and when the Depression hit, the land was still there, but it was unproductive. It was ruined for the purposes of which it was designed. This is Moo's point. The point is that annihilation is not required of meaning uh, for destroy and kill, although that meaning is possible. It seems far better to take the meaning of ruined as described the state of existence, whereas annihilation uh, cannot be described as eternal in that instance. The last issue with Fudge is, I think, his fallacy of faulty assumption. When Fudge reads the church fathers, he reads them as conditionalists. Now, when I read them, I read them as eternal uh, conscious tormentors, we, but we all do that. And so it's really hard to allow someone's readings and writings and position to stand on their own. 
Um, but I do think he has colored his view because of his concept of rejecting the immortality of the soul. The faulty assumption is that if one has a view of conditional mortality, then that person must be an annihilationist. It's not necessarily a logical conclusion, but Fudge does infer that concept. So, to conclude, by and large, I think the church fathers embrace the eternal conscious torment of hell. I think it is Fudge who tries to show that a shift occurred away uh, from that position, um, uh, actually occurred to that position, that he believes annihilationism was uh, the order of the day. I do think he misquotes the fathers in support of his position. Uh, I think it's not a necessarily an attempt to rewrite church history, but I, I give Fudge a lot of credit here to try to understand history. Ronald Rossberg again states this, with regard to the sub loci of the nature of hell, 1995, David Moore held that universalism has not yet made any significant inroads with evangelism. Now, that's 1995. Nine years later, 2004, Morgan and Peterson warned with regard to two aberrations, universalism and annihilationism, that departure from received doctrines is now taking place within the church and not from without. Basically, what Morgan argues is that this thing has gained popularity within, since Moore made his claim in 1995. Um, this is from Ron Rothenberg's paper, a uh, book he's working on. It'll be published, and he did not give me the name of it, but I told him I would at least give him credit for that. Fudge's appeal to the church fathers is an attempt to prove that a theological shift had taken place. But if you survey Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, the shift wasn't with them. Uh, it may have happened, but it's hard to argue that was always a part that... that uh, Annihilation was always a part of Christianity. Their writings really never waver from the eternality of hell as a place of punishment that endures forever. Thank you so much for listening to this long presentation. It shows a lot of your patience, and I appreciate it. Thank you. We, Michael, we need a mic up here. Uh, Y'all need a stretch break, but yeah. I call a stretch break. Stand up for a second. Yeah, yeah. you can stand up for a second, and we'll take some questions. And while we're getting a mic, uh, we've got about 15 minutes for your questions. I want to say uh, I empathize with those of you who have no history with the church fathers yeah. because your eyes are probably uh, glazed over right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, after you stretch, you can be seated. Uh, the, um, uh, I'm a reader, Doc, and I really respect what Dr. Jones has done in going through his interpretation of the church fathers. And to just summarize, for those of you who may not have background, he is reading into the church fathers uh, that they believe in eternal conscious torment. That's Dr. Jones. Whereas Fudge and Froome, who are the conditionalists, read into the church fathers conditionalism. So I love the fact that we can come on a Saturday morning and talk about these things. Uh, and I want to ask the first question and then we'll go uh, with others. And Dr. Jones, this this is my question for you, and it's about 45 seconds of preliminaries, sure. and then the question. I really respect this talk because you have convinced me, beyond any other speaker I've ever heard, that the definition of death can never be annihilationism. Uh, I emphasize that throughout my teaching. That's not what death means. Right. And I heard in your presentation that Ignatius makes the mistake of inconsistency, applying annihilationalism with everybody but Jesus Christ. And I respect that. I'm not sure Fudge, Froome, even Ignatius would define death as annihilationism. And here's my question. Would you be open to the fact that a conditionalist would define annihilationism like this? The absence of resurrection is the entrance into annihilationism. Meaning, 
that annihilation of a human being is tied to the absence of resurrection? That's an interesting question. I, I hesitate to answer affirmative, but I want to. Uh, and here's why I, I hesitate. I'm not certain I understand conditionalist opinion enough to say concisely yes. But it certainly indicates that. I, I mean, it takes you down that trail. But I do think it's a problem for the annihilationist with the resurrection if the soul is strictly united to the body. And if the body dies... If the soul lives on, that's an argument for immortality, which denies their position, but they don't want to say that. I, I think the real issue here is, if, if I read this, and I haven't read it, is that yes, conditionalists believe in the immortality of the soul, but God who gave its life could also take it. I would not have a problem with that, but that's not, that doesn't seem to be where they're going. They want to argue that the immortality of the soul does not exist. Um, Okay. And, and, I, and that's where I struggle with it, right? Yeah, there. I, I understand. If we could do this, and I'll tell you what, we'll move this mic right here. It's a better look. And if you'll speak close. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones, I'd like to raise a point or two about Tertullian. Okay. Um, let me say briefly, I've been following this debate on hell for two or three years. One of the things I've been assiduously looking for is anything online where people have evidence. Good of, luck. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you though, the early early guys, I'm talking about second century people, pre-Tertullian, anybody that was as explicit as, let's say, Arnobius was later about eternal torment. Frankly, I've not really found that any any source. I could say, okay, so, so At here's- At least not online anyway, that's- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, so here, here's a supposition. It's a speculation to throw out at you. All right, let's suppose Fudge is correct about the general atmosphere and belief in the second century of acceptance of conditional immortality. All right? Along comes Tertullian and clearly starts teaching something new. Well, hey, what about this? Speculation. Maybe... Tertullian was going all jihad on the philosophers as a reaction to criticism he may have been getting from his own Christian contemporaries. Like, hey, big T, watch out. Those Platonic philosophers are fooling you with this immortality of the soul business. Uh, that may perhaps explain why he was so worked up to denounce the philosophers as getting all their good stuff from Christians and then perverting it and you know, that kind of thing. So I wonder what you think of that possibility. Can you restate the question? Concerned? Yeah, so the question is, I wonder, could it be the case that a source of the animus that Tertullian had toward the philosophers of his day was simply as a reaction to maybe criticism he was getting for beginning to adopt this immortality of the soul idea? Possibly, but I don't think he... Um he adopted the immortality, so I think he propagated it as biblical. Where I think he went off on the philosophers, and again, this is a personal uh, issue. Uh, I can't concisely state this in his writings. I think once he got saved, I, I think once he became a Christian, he realized the emp uh, emptiness of his own philosophical background, and he began to reject that in favor of uh, Christianity being his mm -hmm. motif for, uh, for his life and work. Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that, mm -hmm. now, I, again, if you ask me to prove that, I can't. Sure. I can't do that. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We've got about just five or six more minutes before we need to take a break, so we'll try to make these questions and answers quick. Right, right. Um, my question has to do with uh, your reference to, to Tertullian taking the text uh, in Matthew and doing it justice. Uh, my understanding is uh, Edward questions the fact that Tertullian says something like uh, Jesus didn't mean that God was going to destroy the soul because we know 
that the soul is immortal. And so, uh, you know, you're, you're stating that Tertullian was faithful to the text. Wasn't that an eisegesis aspect of it? Well, we're dealing with Tertullian or Ignatius? D Tertullian. Tertullian? Yeah, in particular. Your question was, was Tertullian reading something into the scriptures being, being the phrase immortality of the soul? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's the question. I just want to make sure I understand the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, that was okay. Ed, Edward's point that I understood that they made yeah. about Tertullian's... Uh, this is where fudge, I think, needs clarity, and there are better people. I think Chris would be one of them, too, to really understand fudge's thought. Um, if, in my limited understanding of fudge was that he did believe in a resurrection of the body reunited with the soul and maybe even a duration of punishment than annihilation. That argument lends itself to the immortality of the soul, which Fudge would deny. In other I, words, I understand does the soul live saying, on but, beyond the body at death? Right, right. My question had more to do with your statement that Tertullian had not used eisegesis. Yeah, I don't think he did. I think he understood the argument there but that there is a he, warning in but, that passage. But... Fudge points out the fact that he's, he changes what Jesus said. I don't think he does. That's why I criticize Fudge. Okay. I don't think okay. he understands what Tertullian does there. Fudge wants to argue that there is a resurrection right. and that there is annihilationism. But he won't say, at least in his writings, if there's a process of punishment. But the whole argument that Fudge, I, I criticize Fudge for is if he wants to be a conditionalist, fine, be it. Be consistent, though. Why punish something that's already dead if it's conditional upon life anyway, God giving it? If the soul does not have immortality and the body dies, the soul should die, or unless they want to argue it's immortal and lives on, only to be destroyed by God concisively. That is my one area where I think Fudge needs retuning a little bit. I think uh, the pastor's point about uh, the fact that there's no resurrection after the second death is, is a very good one as far as, you know, the distinguishing about the soul. There is the ability, I think that the text that Jesus states does, like you say, warn the difference between man's uh, ability to kill and God. Ability right. to kill mm -hmm. and God's ability to kill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that, that distinction is that there will be no resurrection mm -hmm. after God's yeah. ability. Thank but the you, phrase, sir. the phrase does say he's able to kill body and soul, and that leaves the opening. What does that refer to a resurrection? Yeah. And that's the key. Very good. By the way, yeah. who would have ever thought, next question, who would have ever thought you'd be in a church debating Tertullian? <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I sympathetic to the project. I've also spent time trying to um, work with conditionalists and, and argue over whether Irenaeus, and I've actually spent more time with Tatian and Athanasius, whether they were conditionalists. Mm -hmm. I have a primary question and then a backup question. If Move you to the mark. There. Don't want to do the primary question. My primary question is actually about Athanasius. Um, conditionalists have often pointed out, I think Fudge goes the same yeah. way, that it seems like he's got statements that to move away from God is a movement towards non-being. Um, God is being, to turn from God is to turn to nothingness or non-existence. On the other side, you have um, some arguing that he's actually a universalist because Christ shows what it means to be human. Correct. And Christ raises everyone from the dead. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment, do you find Athanasius to be eternal conscious torment, conditionalist, universalist perhaps? This is where um, I point to the argument of anachronism. I, 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 it's hard for all the fathers to, to address the issue of our day. Uh, uh, Athanasius primarily was concerned with the being of the Trinity more than anything in the person of Jesus Christ. I think his writings flowed out of that, uh, out of that motif. And so you can read him as being conditionalist. I, I do acknowledge that. Um, now, I didn't used to until a couple of years ago when I saw some things. Um, but so, and that's why I stated in the paper, you can read these guys from a certain perspective that, that you would be uh, 
uh, that you would be correct on reading them that way because their writings do not lend themselves to clarity in a lot of cases. Athanasius being one. Justin Martyr being another, by the way. Really? Um, you can't read them that way. I don't think that was the focus of all his writings, so it's hard to say that he was a condition. I tend to believe it wasn't primarily not because he stated that, but because of his association um, in the writings of Arius, who Athanasius told he would burn in hell forever and ever and ever. <laughs> so, it, you know, if you look at how he viewed Irene, uh, uh, Arius, he definitely believed in eternal punishment. Mm. But when he wrote about it elsewhere, you can read him as a conditionalist. Very good. So. Let's do this. Last question uh, before we take a break. Yes, sir. Um, you commented on uh, Fudge having uh, inconsistency with his atonement uh, mm -hmm. theory with if Jesus was annihilated, then he should cease to exist. The way he applies, let me be clear, the way he applies uh, the word eternal uh, punishment, if, if the atonement was uh, infinite, then he can't apply it there. Okay, um, so I was just gonna ask the juxtaposed question of, sure, sure. Um, as a eternal conscious torment, don't you guys, don't you have kind of the same problem with uh, if Jesus, if eternal conscious torment is the state, then wouldn't Jesus have to continually being consciously tormented forever to fully uh, atone for our sins, or is it just a finite time as well? Death is, uh, when death occurs in the body, that's finite, okay? Unless a resurrection, which is a supernatural act of God, takes place. Um, and I do believe that will happen for a believer and unbeliever myself. I do believe that. Uh, so death, death is a finality. If you, are you married? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Did you take the vow to death do his part? <laughs> huh? Did you take the vow to death do his part? I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. You better get the. Yeah. Uh, what do we mean by that? Will you be married forever after death? I don't think that that's <laughs> biblically supported. So. Here's, what, here's what one young man told me as I was counseling in, in a marital concept. I said, do you understand this idea of death do us part? He said, oh, yeah, it's going to kill me. <laughs> he said, marriage is going to kill me. <laughs> no, de death is a finality of earthly contracts, uh, except for the U.S. government. If I owe debt, my son gets to pay it. But uh, in, in all other areas, death is, is a finality. Okay? It takes a resurrection act of God to either reward or to punish. And mm. so the resurrection is a supernatural act. I think it was a supernatural act of Jesus Christ. Mm. So that's how okay. I would. Okay, thank you. Good. Listen, excellent. Here's, give Dr. Jones a round of applause. Very good. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. I appreciate it. You're welcome.